Dear viewers, it is one thing to enjoy music, to listen to music, to appreciate music. It's another thing altogether to create music, to compose music, to produce the kind of music that people can appreciate, love and admire. Have with me today one such person who is gifted with the ability to create music. It's Ricky Cage. Warm welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. How did you actually get into it, coming from a family of doctors? So it, it was a natural transition uh, during my school days because uh, during high school everybody wants to impress women so the best way to do it was to actually pick up a guitar and start playing. So that's the reason why I started playing my first few chords and my first few notes on the guitar. And uh, from then onwards, once I got into college, uh, I started realizing... You used to play it well? Uh, fairly well, actually. Enough to Hotel play Hotel California. Songs. Yeah, the usual thing. Hotel <laughs> California, Summer of 69, by the rivers of Savage Garden. Long. The mushy songs, you know, which could yeah, impress yeah. people. And okay. uh, songs that people could hum along with. So, yeah, so basically that. And then once I got into college, I started taking it a lot more seriously. Okay. And uh, that's when I started... Uh, that's when I thought that, okay, this has to be my profession. Because when you play the guitar, you uh, cannot have that kind of uh, freedom to innovate because mostly you have these set chords and you play them and all that. But to be able to compose music is a different thing. So did it actually uh, start from playing the guitar to composing music or uh, it was a different thing? Um, actually, yeah, it did start from playing the guitar. You know, the guitar has got limitless, uh, the guitar's got limitless possibilities actually when it comes to sound and when it comes to composition techniques. Okay. And uh, once, uh, uh, once I thought of making it my profession, I started learning how when to play the keyboard. When did you decide to make it your profession? Um, this was, I think, in my 12th standard. Okay, why? I, in my 12th standard because, uh, I mean, I, I loved it and I thought that this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And uh, I was scared used by the... You play it all the time? I used to play it all the time. Only the guitar? Uh, the guitar and uh, bits and pieces of the keyboard okay. at that time, at that point of time. Were you trained? Uh, no, I wasn't trained actually, unfortunately, but uh, later on I started getting my training. Okay. So, because then later on I realized that I have to unlearn a lot of the techniques that I have inculcated because they are actually the wrong techniques even though they sound good. Okay. Because there's a difference between sounding good and being called a good musician and there is a difference and, and uh, actually having a very strong foundation in music. So I needed that strong foundation in music. Okay, to so be able to read music. To be able to read music, to be able to understand music, to be able to learn the rules in order to break them later. And even the thing like reading music itself, many people can't understand what are these people talking about. Exactly, it's very important to uh, to read music okay. actually because... Uh, you read music? Yeah, I read case? music, I read music, yeah. Okay, where were you trained? Uh, I was trained by a pianist, uh, Nisia Majoli. Okay. So I was trained by her, then I was trained by Prakash Hontaki who's a, who's a Hindustani classical vocalist and a, and a guitar and a Hawaiian guitar player. So they are my favorite musicians so I thought the best thing would be is to learn under them basically. Okay, but when did you decide all this? In uh, the 12th? Yeah, around that time, around that time. But that's a very crucial year in a boy's life. Exactly, but uh, I was okay, pretty... Instead of actually thinking of getting into a professional uh, course, yeah. which you ultimately ended up doing. Exactly. Uh, you had your vision set. Yeah, I had my vision set and I also knew that I'm going to be dragged into the whole professional course thing because uh, that's what is expected out of everybody okay, my your age. your father is a doctor. Exactly. My, I come from, a gen, from generations of doctors. My brother is also a doctor now. Okay. Uh, so basically that it was expected out of me to actually complete a degree and, uh, and get a fallback plan. But you did not want to become a doctor. No, I did not want to become a doctor. And Why? I'm, uh, see, in retrospect, uh, many people say that it's good that you have an education and like you have a doctor before your name mm. and stuff like that. But my whole argument is this, that you sp I spent five years doing this particular degree where I went, uh, went to college at 9 o'clock in the morning, mm. came back home at 5 o'clock. I used mm. to do assignments, I used to do exams. Did not do actually much. Yeah, and during this whole time, imagine if I'd spent this kind of dedication for five years doing assignments, doing exams on music. Okay. Where would I have reached because I got a doctorate that a in music? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could have got a doctorate in music or something like that. Where would I have reached by now when okay, it comes to my theory? Didn't you knowledge? like doing uh, dentistry? Um, I've got a way of liking whatever I do. Mm. So at the end of the day, but I you did up, well too, didn't you? I did pretty well in my dentistry actually. Okay. And I remember during my internship, I used to I used to treat the most number of patients in my college because I could not just sit down and be idle. But you were um, quite uh, decided about not becoming a dentist. Definitely, because the day I got my, I was just waiting to get my degree so that I could just put it into the cupboard and do but music full time. But did you feel that it's actually unjust? In the sense, many people try to become dentists, doctors, because you know they really. 
foresee a lot of things for themselves if they get these degrees. But somebody like you is so fortunate because, you know, you came from a family of doctors, you got an opportunity to do dentistry, you got to a good college, you had all the facilities mm -hmm. to do well. But you could have still become a musician by practicing your profession too. Exactly. That, but, that's very but, true. But uh, you could have actually quit it then, dedicated yourself to music if at all you did not actually like it so much. Because it's something like, you know, you were, you were, you were not being true to yourself. That's very true what you're saying. Uh, I mean, that uh, for me, that was a period of time which uh, I could have spent uh, doing a lot more uh, when it comes to my present field. It's only because of familial compulsions? But it's, it's only because of familial com uh, compulsions. There's no other reason. But your family is supposed to be very progressive. You were born in the US, yeah. North Carolina, and came to India by the time you started schooling. And uh, and I'm sure that you know they could have understood you very well. I guess they could have understood me, but, uh, but they did not. Because uh, the thing is this, that uh, every parent wants uh, at least assumes that they're doing the best for their children or whatever. Okay. So the thing is that uh, they always felt that, okay, if he wants to do music, he has to have a fallback plan in case he does not do well. Oh, okay. So uh, I guess parents do not, uh, sometimes it, it is a matter of like uh, being paranoid, number one, and number two, it could be a matter of actually not believing in the abilities of my music skills okay. to see whether I can sustain myself But physically. it's not easy to become a dentist too, just by having a degree, right? <laughs> exactly. That's my point. Because even if it's a doctor or it's a dentist or it's a cardiologist, you may study for like donkey's years. But the fact is, is that if you, if you have one mal malpractice lawsuit against you, okay. your degree is gone and then that's it. Your seven years are wasted. Here you can give a lot of flops and still be a Yeah, exactly. Musician. You can still do something. So that's what... Okay. Uh, Innovate, try, yeah, change. To, Exactly, because art is a valid profession and people do not understand that. Anything to do with art, if you treat it as a profession, okay. it is a valid profession. And I treat my job as a profession, basically. Okay. Yeah. But uh, when did you actually start the studio of yours? Uh, my studio... This has been there for many years. Many years, Even yeah. while you were studying, Exactly. Right? Uh, I think I started my studio, if I'm not mistaken, in my second year of uh, dentistry. Okay. So I had the studio. And you bought some equipment. Yeah, yeah, I started off small, then I expanded, and now I've expanded to where I am, which is a pretty decent. You also stage. had an orchestra room. Uh, yeah, I, I always had that, but it was not well done. Okay. And then as I progressed and as I made more money, I progressed it and I made the orchestration room much better. I got the acoustics done up much better. Okay. So that's what. So now I've got one of the. But that state was of a bold move, wasn't it? Yeah, it was because uh, the thing is that. I mean, to be able to make this as a profession, yeah. anybody would have taken it as a leisure activity. Exactly. Uh, you could have still done well, but to be able to actually foresee yourself uh, establishing as a musician must have been a very tough decision. It is a difficult situation. Because, because you were in Karnataka, you knew very well that you had to get business from here. Yeah. You did not even know the language, right, apart from English and you speak Hindi too. A little bit of it, yeah. Okay. So? So the thing is, is that uh, I started off doing jingles. Mm. And, uh, and that was the time uh, the FM market was opening up, Exactly, right? exactly. Very lucky that was the for exact you, time, in fact. Yeah. So I started off doing jingles and... Uh, and at one point you were doing all the uh, jingles for these... Uh, FM channels like yeah. Radio City and... Me, even right now, I would say that, um, I would say about 90% uh, of the jingles that originate out of Bangalore are composed by me. Whether it's for about television... 3,000? Yeah, yeah, I must have crossed 3,000 easily, yeah. Okay. Uh, 3,000 for very clients, for every single client that Doesn't every it single brand... Does repetitive? It does not get repetitive, that's the best part. Because uh, for every jingle, you work with a different person. So mm. for me, it is like, I will never stop doing jingles, even if, I, even if I end up doing tons and tons of films or tons and tons of international albums. Why? Because the reason is that every jingle takes about a day to finish off. And it's almost like a workout. Because see, today, let's say I compose a, a Tamil folk jingle. Tomorrow, I'll be composing a Bhojpuri folk jingle. Okay. Uh, the day after tomorrow, let's say I'll compose so a hip-hop jingle. you to understand the gamut of uh, music exactly. itself. To what extent you can stretch it. Exactly. What all you can do with it. Exactly. Okay. Like for example, I do a jingle for, let's say, um, uh, a few days back I did a jingle for Zane Mobile, which is, uh, which is the top mobile service providers in the Middle East. I had to do a Middle Eastern flavored jingle. Okay. Then, uh, the, then I, had to do, I had to do an Africano jingle a few days back. So basically you, you get to learn so many different forms of music while you're doing your jingles. And it's almost like a workout where you're given a brief and then you have to somehow come out with something that... Okay, uh, but it, personally? Of course. I, I, in it's, everything? It's all me, yeah. It's all me. Oh, yeah. but it becomes really difficult. It is very difficult. Is that the reason you don't go anywhere at all? You're there at home all the time? That, that's the main reason. That's <laughs> the main reason. I'm always in the studio. Anybody can find me at the that's studio. That's all the reasons many people don't even get to see you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't socialize much I do too. not socialize at all and I do not go out for any parties. You'll never see me at a party. 
and uh, I'm in the studio starting at seven o'clock in the morning till two o'clock in the night. Okay, I eat my lunch in the studio. I eat my dinner in the studio. It? That's a lot of dedication. A lot of dedication, yeah. Extreme hard work. Extreme hard work. And yeah. it's been there for at least about eight years now. Yeah, eight nine years, yeah. Oh, it's really surprising <laughs> when people really want to work less and earn more these days. Yeah. But for me, I love my profession. So for me, it's not the timings. Because if you love what you're doing, then for me, it's my free time. Two I mean, as I said, from 7 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock at night is my free time. Because I completely, thoroughly enjoy myself doing what I'm doing. Okay. But do you train yourself? Do you update yourself? Of course. Uh, with what's happening in the music world? You have to. You have to. Uh, I Because then if you're continuously busy in mm. this, when do you actually get time to look at other people's? Uh, for me, work, I buy a lot of you know, music so that you know yeah. you don't uh, you know sound like you're copied because you know there could be an Correct. accidental repetition. Exactly. Uh, the thing about me is that I buy a lot of music in the sense that I buy a lot of CDs uh, per week. I end up uh, uh, spending enough to buy about at least about 20 albums a week. I buy mm -hmm. and I load them onto my system and I listen to music all the time. When I'm in the car, I'm always listening to music. Plus, uh, I've got a TV in my studio uh, on which I watch various music channels and stuff like that while things are rendering on my system during my free time while I'm eating food. Okay. So I'm always constantly updating myself with, with the latest trends. kind of resource, uh, you should be a natural uh, requirement in the movie industry, right? But right. But you've not got so many opportunities as yet. Why? Um, I think one of the main reasons is that uh, what I've heard from people is that I'm not at all approachable, which I feel is completely wrong. Uh, many people say I'm not don't approachable. Even receive your phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't, but uh, yeah, but I'm uh, I'm I'm always approachable. Even if somebody leaves a message, you know, you get a reply after a week. That's happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that does not happen often. <laughs> this is not the first time. Yeah. I think uh, it's happened over the years also. <laughs> uh, no, but I usually do, and plus I'm always on email. And I'm the smile on your face is very deceptive. Actually. <laughs> you know, people think that you're very, you're a very nice guy just by looking at your smile. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> no, no, it's a joke. Okay. So basically, I uh, I reckon that I'm quite an approachable person when it comes to work, basically, and like when it comes to people talking to me about work, and uh, you know, I'm not the kind of person who will shun anybody down or whatever. But uh, but that's the thing. Uh, people don't find me approachable, and I, according to me, the main reason, the number one reason, is that uh, I do not go out much. And you don't want to be approached by people who are not serious about your work. Exactly. I need people you don't to be want serious to about spend my work. time with anybody who is just talking to you. Nonsense. Exactly, that's the one thing. I need, I need people to be serious about my work. You're very they... No, I'm not. Uh, I wouldn't call it that. You want to talk to somebody only if there is business. No, no, no I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where friendship is aside okay. and uh, socializing yeah, but, is aside. But it's actually very good because you yeah. know you have this prime time of your life where you need to be doing good things. Exactly. Where you need to be achieving. Where you need to be producing. It's not the time for you to uh, uh, what do you say? idling around, right? Yeah, that's also there. And then when it comes to work, especially when somebody ca calls me and or comes to my studio about work, I would like that person to be serious about my work or serious about using me rather yeah, than yeah. just... And get to me. the point. And, and also get to the point. Pro at, okay. uh, yeah, Instead of just probably. talking about it, talking about yeah. it, talking about it. But you exactly know what's going to happen yeah. ultimately. Yeah, and, and, uh, uh, and this does not mean uh, nevertheless that I have not gotten offers uh, in the past. I, I keep getting offers, but the thing is that People come to me uh, saying that, you know, I want one song like Jinke Marina, I want one song like Anisu Tede, I want one song. So then it becomes difficult to approach these people because it's it's better that they That's go to the... That's not what you want to yeah, do. Yeah, it's better that they approach the original music directors of these particular songs <laughs> that they wanted to actually get. Okay. I mean that uh, I would like somebody to come to me for my abilities basically because uh, I believe I can deliver. Okay, your first movie was Accident. Right. Okay, that's also Mr. Ramesh Arvind. Exactly. And then was... Uh, Venkata and Sankata. And now okay, Crazy, Crazy Kutumba. Kutumba. And you've done something for a Hindi movie too. Correct. Which is to be released in 2010. Yeah, this year. Okay, but are you getting more offers? Yeah, I've That's one thing that you're not very happy about. People have not still recognized your ability, your potential in producing music for... Uh, movies, yeah. Movies. And, uh, yeah, basically... Or is it actually that, you know, it's a different art altogether? I wouldn't call it a different... Maybe because, you know, you've been do doing only things with uh, these 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Uh, that's not true, actually, because uh, I've also uh, I've also worked with Universal Music USA, with Wagram France, with Buddha Bar France to produce full-end tracks for them. And uh, I've been really, really successful in the international market, especially in the US and the French markets. And if you go on the internet and you look for my name, you'll find tons and tons of fan websites over there. So the thing is that uh, these particular albums have done really, really well over there and uh, my album which I released in the US has, uh, has remained on the charts for the last three years in okay. the lounge charts. 
So basically, I'm used to doing full end tracks for Kama various people. Sutra. It's called Kama Sutra Lounge. Yeah, I've done yeah. a part one, I've done a part two, and now I'm working on part three. Okay. Yeah. So you become an expert in Kama Sutra. Music. Not necessarily, but music based on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> music inspired and based on it. Okay. Yeah. Now you also got uh, involved in some campaigns like right. uh, Save Lal Bagh campaign. Yeah. And you were very actively involved in it because yeah. you felt that you know. Uh, was it that you were using your music to do this campaign or it was just a campaign? Uh, see, the thing is this that uh, I uh, reckon that I am an environmentalist by heart mm -hmm. because uh, I believe that uh, the green cover in Bangalore is really, really important for us to actually survive, um, survive out uh, global warming and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So now the thing is this that I was really heartbroken when I realized that they're going to be cutting down uh, in excess of 300 trees in these areas of Nanda Road and Lal Bagh. Mm -hmm. And I was even more heartbroken to find out that the protest had only reached to a couple of 50 or 60 or 100 Did people. Did you have the time to read the newspapers to know about I, I'm <laughs> always reading the newspapers. Okay. I'm always keeping myself in touch with okay. the news and stuff like that. So that's something that I always do. And it's very important in my industry so to keep in touch. So what happened? So then I realized that there are just few people. So I, I was just thinking to myself, how do we make this couple of, uh, uh, couple of 50, couple of tens, couple of hundreds into thousands? Because every time there was a protest, only about 40, 50 people would land up at the protest. That's when I realized that we have to do something big. So I composed a track, then I made a music video on it. I gave it to various channels to play for free. And it was completely non-commercial. I just spent my own money doing it. And I just made this thing and I gave it free for all. There was no copyright on it. I clearly mentioned on the internet and on my blogs and stuff like that, that there's no copyright. Anybody can use this freely just to spread the message. Mm. Then I realized that close to about uh, 10,000 or 20,000 people had already downloaded this as a ringtone. Mm. So people were actually expressing solidarity with the cause. And it had reached out to a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, thousand people and uh, apparently I heard from news channels that, uh, that uh, they had got inquiries in excess, of, in excess of hundreds and thousands mm -hmm. of people. And then the last particular protest which happened after, the, after this particular video went live on air, uh, the protest uh, attracted close to about 4,000, 5,000 people. Oh, very good. So, and the name of the song was Metro Go Underground and I remember a headline for the phase four or phase five of the metro which is actually going underground. Uh, now, the headline of the newspaper read, Metro now actually goes underground. Oh. So it had actually reached out to a lot of people. But you have made jingles for almost every important company Brand, yeah. in, the, in the public domain, right? Yeah. Uh, and also you composed the theme song for KPL. Right. You have a fantastic memory, don't you? You seem to remember a lot of things, Laura. Like how you remember what I did in your classroom when I came many years ago. Exactly, I remember. My first memory of you is in my, uh, what do you call that, in my classroom in Bishop Cotton's where you had, you taught us theatre over there. You taught us, uh, once you had come to teach us theatre and the second time you had... Uh, it's only about me it you remember English. other things too in the uh, sense of what other people have taught you. Of, of course I remember, but of course, uh, uh, I mean that you obviously left a mark because, uh, because I remembered uh, the, both the classes in Bishop Cotton's. Okay. Yeah. Were you ever interested in acting? Uh, never actually, never. That was something I was never interested in. <laughs> is it because that you need to take you out of your house? <laughs> Probably, because uh, the thing about me is that... One I of the things that you like about your profession mm. is also that you can do it inside your house. Exactly, behind the scenes. That's something that attracts me a lot, yeah, behind the scenes. Okay, you're a very uh, homely kind of a person, somebody who likes the um, environs of a very comfortable, uh, secure atmosphere, right? I think that's true about me, right, yeah. In the sense, you know, you would, you're not the venturing kind. I'm not, I'm I not. I mean, you would rather like business coming to you. That's one of the reasons perhaps that, you know, the movies are not coming to you. Exactly, because, you know, because I'm not the kind of person that, who actually in, go out. In yeah. that domain, you need to go out. out. You need to meet people, yeah. you need to ask for it. Sometimes you need to show things to people. Correct. 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 You need to pamper, cajole, yeah. pat the back. Exactly. You know, be kicked. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Tortured. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, you get your rewards and awards. Exactly. Yeah, so is that, do you have to change yourself? See, the thing is that uh, when it came to the jingle industry and advertising industry, uh, uh, the advertisers, they spend tons and tons of money on every campaign. Like, let's say I do a campaign for a uh, cell phone brand. Mm. Uh, I do a signature tune for them. Then what happens is that uh, they, they, they end up putting in crores and crores to support that particular campaign. So they cannot go wrong. They have to look for the right talent. So they search. They do not need people to come to them. Okay. They actually search for the right person to do it. And that's the reason why most people come to me, because they understand that I can deliver. Which was your first jingle? Um, Sadhaniya Sambrahma Graha Karige Namana Kendra Bank Vevara Iga Nalakku Laksha Koti Ennu Dati Dei Kendra Bank Tanna Mooa Thiyolu Million Graha Karu Paladararu Matto Abhimani Giligi Tanna Dhani Vadagal Ennu Sali Sutta Dei um, 
tons of them actually. I don't no, even remember. No. Who gave you the first opportunity to do uh, something? Actually, there were five or six of them together. There was one for Spice Telecom. There was one for ING Y Share. Okay. How there was did one they have the Adel. confidence to engage you? Um, uh, they sort of uh, uh, they met up with me, I guess. Uh, I guess yeah, with all the clients, it was that they met up with me. I gave them a demo. And during those days, they would not trust my abilities entirely. Okay. So I would have to make something known as a scratch, which is like a demo. And then they would approve that, and they would see, okay, I can do something for their brand. Ultimately, pay you no advance. No, no advances and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, so you you would have to do these things. You had had to do a lot of free work also okay. to Did establish. Did you ever yourself. try singing? Never, never. Why? Again, do you like people who sing? <laughs> <laughs> Do you? <laughs> like people who sing, I'm uh, sure. Of course, I put tremendous know, respect for anybody who sings. Yeah, you worked with Sonu Nigam. I've worked Shreya with yeah, almost every singer in India. Yeah, with, yeah. with Chankar Mahadevan, with Shreya Goshal, with, uh, with everybody, with Zakir. You're Zakir's a very singer. fortunate guy, yeah. aren't you? I am, I am definitely. Yeah, for people who love music, I think they would yeah. all love to be you. <laughs> yeah. Right? But because with Do you know that? How, how lucky you are? Yeah, definitely. Because with the, as I, it's as not just I about the business, but to yeah. be able to live in music all the time. Yeah, because very uh, few people can get it. Right? What I've been fortunate Though about. Everybody may ask for it. Correct. What I've been fortunate about is that the three thousand odd jingles. So the, I've worked with almost every single musician in India possible through these jingles. Second thing is my international work. In my international work, I've got the opportunity to, to actually compose songs where people have uh, people like Shankar Mahadev when I perform. People like Pandit Shiv Kumar Sharma, Ustad Zakir Hussain, uh, uh, Pandit uh, Hari Prasad Chaurasia, Rakesh Chaurasia, Ashwin, Naveen. I've performed. I've uh, compose songs for almost every single musician One possible. One thing I've noticed yeah. in your music is that sound that you produce, I'm not just talking about the music, hmm. the feel of the sound is very exotic. I think that's your interest, to produce something that people have not heard before. The combination of sounds, the kind of instruments that you use. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, is that what you do, or does it happen accidentally? For instance, uh, some of the music, songs that you've produced or rather the music that you're composed for. Uh, the, the, the sound, the song could, could have been sung by anybody, but the, but the music that you're given are like, you know, out of the world. Uh, I'm really appreciative that you noticed it and uh, I really thank you for that. Uh, but that's something, yeah, that is a conscious effort to, uh, uh, to craft the sound. These are like yeah. the, the usual instruments, but when you, when you combine mm. them, they produce some, some ethereal, you know, experience. Yeah, like for example, if you so look maybe at maybe that's uh, why that you're so successful in the jingle business. Exactly, because that's you that know, could you have be such a little time. Yeah, you need to produce such an impact. Correct. You at least when you have the whole song, sometimes you know you can you can play with the BGM yeah. and you know you can you can go slow in <laughs> in yeah. between. Correct. You can play on the voice. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. One second. You can play on the voice and all that. But here. Uh, yeah, that's true. Like, for example, if you look at uh, look at uh, my biggest hit in the Kannada film industry, that's Bama Leba. Mm. If you look at the instrumentation of that, it's it's got Celtic instruments in it. It's got Chinese instrument that is Oriental instruments in it. It's got your regular sarangi in it for the for uh, for the emotional value. It's got a complete orchestra okay. which is played in a more uh, Oriental style. So, I mean, it's different styles come confluencing together to form a song. And uh, the basic thing is that for me, I do not make a song in a genre. I do not set out to make a rock song and say I'm going to use guitars, drums. Okay. I try to make a song and whatever fits into the emotion of that song, I just get in whatever varied instruments okay. from whichever genre. with the uh, Kannada songs these yeah. days, do you understand those songs? Yeah, you definitely. get them translated, actually. I, I do that at times, but uh, nowadays I understand the language pretty decently. Yeah, enough and you to use some of these uh, songs from poets, uh, established poets, exactly. well-known poets. Exactly. I did that. The first time I did that was with Bamale Ba itself, uh, where we used uh, Mr. B. R. Lakshman Rao's uh, uh, famous poem, and uh, we composed uh, that. It was a 20-year-old poem at that time. And I composed a whole new tune to it and, uh, and uh, brought it out in the market. And it did extremely well for all of us. So, uh, so then I realized that that's when I started going deeper and deeper into it. And I realized that there's a wealth of, uh, of, uh, of uh, literary giants and, and, uh, and of, po of poetry, of literature within, uh, within uh, Karnataka. Okay, but there is this about, you know, uh, people finding it convenient to write music to the tune. Exactly. But would you actually prefer to compose music to a song that's already written or to produce a tune and give it to a writer to write a song? That's why they just uh, most of the times write songs that rhyme then have meaning in them. 
Yeah, see, the thing is that uh, it's, it's much easier to actually compose the music and get a writer to write to it. But uh, with Crazy Kutumba, that is the film which I did, uh, which I composed music to four existing poems, I decided I want to go out of my comfort level, uh, comfort uh, zone, sorry, and, uh, and actually compose music which is befitting of these lyrics and uh, try to repopularize these lyrics. Okay. And uh, so that's but exactly that what I try to do. a little more uh, challenging? It's extremely challenging. Because uh, the emphasis uh, could yeah. be wrong. It is sometimes, extremely challenging, but then what's the point of... Sometimes it could uh, be sung wrongly, yeah. because you know, you may, you may have to lengthen a certain yeah. sound, the, the, the uh, impact would be more on certain, certain syllables. Words and syllables, right. Uh, so, so people actually prefer to get songs written yeah. it, it's to always, order. Yeah, it is challenging as you mentioned, but then what's the point of doing things which are always in your comfort zone? Okay. You have to keep reinventing yourself and I tried doing that. And uh, there are times when I've done it the other way around also when it becomes a necessity. Like for example, uh, in, on Independence Day last year, I did a track called Ni Badaladare, which was about uh, bringing a change in yourself rather than trying to change the universe. Because everybody talks about changing the universe, but nobody talks about changing themselves. And uh, a, a re the main reason why I did this particular national patriotic song is that I realized that there are very, very few nationally patriotic songs in Canada. Mm. And then I thought that let's make a befitting song in Canada which is nationally patriotic. So then I got five of my, six of my friends, that is uh, uh, B. Jeshri, Madam, Rajesh Krishnan, Pallavi, uh, Hemant, uh, Avinash Chebbi, and uh, Mr. Ellen Shastri. I got them together and each of them sang different lines in the song, brought them together, got the song, made a video on it. And it is really successful, the song. Uh, I mean, that it, it sort of created almost like a movement, the particular song. So, uh, so that particular song, I'd written the tune first, and then I got uh, Mr. Kaviraj to write lyrics for it because I wanted, I had an idea of what exactly I wanted to be written, and Kaviraj uh, did that. Okay. So the song is Ni Badaladare. It's just about changing yourself rather than uh, changing the universe. Okay. Um, yeah. What are the plans as of now? Uh, you will continue things. to make your jingles. Yeah, I want to do music in every form possible. Okay. I've been fortunate to do any, the any, anything very challenging, anything that's that's very different. I'm always open to doing new things. Right now, I want to do tributes to legendary music uh, uh, within the Kannada music industry. Okay. Uh, legendary musicians, legendary uh, poets and stuff like that. That's something that I've been working on. It's work in progress. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been fortunate, as I said, uh, to do the 3000 odd jingles. Then I do a lot of international work. Then I do the Kannada music work. Now I've signed two films in, in Bollywood. International uh, films on hand? Yeah, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing more work with Buddha Bar in France. So I've already composed uh, close to six songs for them for their various compilations, which have become huge international hits. Mm -hmm. And I'm also working on Kama Sutra Lounge 3 with, uh, with uh, Universal Music in the USA. Okay. And I've been fortunate with Universal Music that I interact directly with the vice president of that company because he just loves my music. And he apparently keeps telling me that he plays it all the time in his office, Mr. Rod Lynham. He's yeah. the kind of, he's the person who's actually signed on artists like Beyonce for his record company, okay. Mariah Carey and stuff like that. Okay. And he's a fan of my That's music. That's a huge future to you, right? That's a huge, huge thing. Yes. Yeah. I think that, you know, people should see a very great uh, personality in you who will shape up in the years to come, yeah. even in the international I arena. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so, fingers crossed. Okay, but do you actually see yourself growing that big? Yeah, the, the there thing, is the possibility, the the probability. Yeah, because I mean, Rod, uh, Mr. Rod Lynham, the guy from Universal, as I just mentioned, the vice president over there, he is constantly telling me, "Why don't you move to New York? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, and make albums for me and stuff like that. Work for me, work with my artists oh. and stuff like that." But uh, I've never found myself because uh, I love doing what I do over here. Okay. So and uh, I can work out of here and give him music like what I've been doing with the previous two albums that I've given him. Um, and plus the other thing that attracts me to, uh, to doing music uh, for them is that, you know, like uh, Kama Sutra Lounge 1 and 2 were basically Indian music. They, they featured artists like Shiv Kumar Sharma, they are featured artists like Ustad Sultan Khan, okay. featured artists like uh, Hari Prasad Chaurasia and various other artists. So now the thing is this, that uh, that particular music, they have not even released it in India because they feel that there's no market for it in India. So you can imagine there is a bigger market for classical fusion music in USA and in France and in Germany than it is in India. But looking at yeah. you know, what you have, the sorry, but look, but look at the potential you have, the way you're doing things yeah. now, to how people are appreciating your music. What do your parents feel about it today? See, my parents, uh, when I was doing jingles, they didn't understand what I was doing, and uh, because uh, their friends would ask them in uh, return that uh, in in turn that you know what does their son do? He's a musician. Does he do music for films? Um, no, he does music for other stuff. Or uh, does he sing? No, he does not sing. Then what does he do? 
<laughs> so at least now what kind of music? yeah what kind of music so at least now they can say that oh, he's a music director finished okay, okay. <laughs> so then it becomes easier Are they proud for people of it? Uh, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Uh, at least they've now. They've not yet expressed it. Yeah, they've not yet, yet expressed it. Uh, yeah. uh, but they yeah. will, I'm sure. Yeah, and then they'll make them very proud. Yeah, and then now, uh, now the what do you call that? Uh, they, they see that I'm doing well. I'm successful mm -hmm. in the sense that I've built my own studios. I've got a studio Learning now in Bombay. I've got my own car now. So basically, that's where they start realizing that okay, he's doing well. He's doing better than what he would have done if he was a doctor. <laughs> On that note, I must tell you, Ricky Cage, anybody can just wish you all the best and nothing else. I mean, I really, really appreciate it coming to me.